Definitely. It was based on the uh, NY Buffalo Haslam. Like, you know, it's tall, it's impressive, and we wanted the player to feel really uh, weak and small compared to it. So it was definitely uh, a good, uh, good idea to go with that one. I mean, it's, it's always, it always starts as a collaboration. It's, it's usually about six or seven people from, from the core of the team. And people just start throwing out ideas. When you pitch something and, and people start groaning and laughing, you know, like the, when, when we came up with, um, with Gluskin, just like the, the reactions to that were so visceral in the room. It just felt like there was, there was obviously a lot of room to run with him. Of course, you have characters like Nick and Laird who are two characters in one, holding a bow and arrow and a lantern, and that is kind of its own challenge unto itself. You know, it's, I remember uh, pitching Nick and Laird in Outlast 2, and that one was another one where people were just like, yes, absolutely. Uh, but really, you know, everything starts with the inspiration of, you know, Phil, Chateau, JT, and Hugo, and we try to run with it as best as we can. It starts with their imagination and their words. It comes down to the character department. And their art helps inspire the animation. The sound helps inspire the animation. And the atmosphere of the game helps bring all of that into focus. So it's, it's, it's hard to say because everything that makes these characters what they are, even when it comes down to just me, is really a collaborative and, and integral iterative process that uh, Every character has its own challenges and has its own rewards. Murkoff is definitely a, a creature of the 20th century, right? I think of Murkoff as like the most concrete sort of nugget at the center of all of the sort of secret uh, corruption. Like, like all of our comforts in the Western world seem to rely on a lot of fairly evil shit that we try not to look at too closely um, just to kind of get through the days. And Murkoff is like a nice way to, to focus all of that stuff. We're going to get a lot more of the earlier days of Murkoff in the trials. And we're, we're sort of talking now and about how much we're going to reveal about, about oh, I've, got, I've got a notion in my head of when when the corporation starts and what it is and how that changes through the history of the early 20th century. But uh, it's about as specific as I'm going to get now. It's not G.I. Joe, right? Like it's not, they're not Cobra. They're, they're a company and Murkoff wants to make money. And like, if you're going to do that in as, as a pharmaceutical slash military intelligence adjacent company, um, you're going to get up to some pretty, grifty shit, right? So the inspiration for our last came from uh, a very wide uh, variety of uh, influences. Uh, we basically borrowed anything that we felt could be uh, useful uh, in the context of, uh, of horror. So a lot of the ideas obviously come from horror movies, but not just uh, not just horror movies. And there's not like one specific reference, like like that, that's the main. Obviously, I mean, there's Amnesia, The Dark Descent, that was a, a, a huge influence, but uh, not necessarily for game design stuff, but just as a uh, proof of, uh, of a concept in terms of uh, business model. Uh, because there were very few horror games at the time, and mostly most of them were indie titles, and and so it allowed us to uh, do meetings with investors. Yeah, and these are Doug Dixon was a inf big influence, uh, but uh, actually more for business reasons than uh, uh, game design. And then everything else is just like bits and pieces from all over the place: books, movies, uh, other games. Uh, so I couldn't like point in one direction uh, specifically. Probably my uh, biggest influence, although to be honest, at the time I was not really realizing it, but it's Clive Barker. I read a lot of Cl Clive Barker novels in my 20s. I, I kind of forgot about it, but, but then while we were doing Outlast 2, somebody mentioned Clive Barker and I was like, well, yeah, now actually a lot of the uh, things I was pushing for make, <laughs> started making more sense because I realized that uh, a lot of these things were coming from the Clive Barker style, just uh, his style of, uh, of horror, very, very edgy and, and uh, 
uh, wanting to put uh, people in a very, uh, bring them in, in very uncomfortable places. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> there's, there's every chance I'm going to get hit by a bus tomorrow. Like, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's, what's coming down the line. Um, but, but I've, I've certainly got notions about it, but, but we'll see. All of the ideas about like what Miles experience of the world post Outlast one is, is like all of my favorite philosophical shit, you know, and like, and you can, you can get into like questions of, of, uh, artificial intelligence and octopus neurology and just like all of this, as soon as you're getting into sentient networked intelligence like you it's it, it becomes really hard and, I, and i'm like not even a person who believes in sentience itself entirely so the short answer is that you probably won't get a good answer out of <laughs> okay um the baby is is he real? Of course, it's in a video game. Why isn't it real? Is he? I don't know. Uh you tell me. Yeah, no, I mean I <laughs> I feel like the second half of that question is the best answer to that question right that billy and miles are both still alive and taking over ants is kind of like how i would explain what the wall rider is it's all of us trying to imagine what a the experience of a networked intelligence is or what artificial intelligence would 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 think like the whole reason i chose ants is that i think ants are a really interesting experiment in terms of like what sentience is and there's a lot of smarter people than me who have have written and thought about this but but like you know the, the the notion that ants as a group of a million are one organism that makes decisions and cho chooses and strategizes and does things that things that we consider sentient also do i don't know there's, there's a lot of examples in nature if, if i could express it more eloquently i wouldn't have to put it in a video game maybe <laughs> but uh ai is a weird term but I would say that uh, the wall rider is as sentient as you or I are. But I don't entirely trust your sentience or mine. I mean, the wall rider is it's a it's a, a a cloud of nanobots biologically generated out of suffering and nightmares, right? And with and in its inception was based in sort of old Germanic mythologies and uh, was then further corrupted by grossness of military intelligence and capitalism. So it can, it can eat things, but not consume them. <laughs> that's the, that's the last page of the last issue of the, the first run of the Murkoff report. I don't know how to answer that question without sounding like an asshole, right? Like it's sort of, it's sort of writing a, 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 a grad school paper on something I wrote. And the whole notion of the comics was to tie together those first two Outlast games and, and sort of show a little bit more of the connective tissue that we were, were talking about kind of below the surface there. It's a poetic flourish, you know? Like it's an even, you, you study the way the Bible sort of came together, you know, like it's, it's, it is cobbled together from a lot of different spiritual ideas that are kind of spiritual interpretations of the same notions and it kind of pulled these traditions together right if, if you ask people what the holy spirit's role is in in christianity like you'll you'll get 19 different answers right and the notion of the trinity is super interesting it was something that we like kind of talked about a decent amount in terms of the whole like miles wall rider thing um it's a it's a squishy question i'm not sure Uh, no, Eddie is not half French. Inspiration uh, was not uh, based on a specific character. It was more, it was more, what do we need this character to do, 
to create the sequence we we want to have in the game, uh, and then how do we uh, build and, and and create his personality and uh, and his traits so that it fits what he needs to be doing. I believe that you know you, you're defined by your actions. So I guess in this case we came up with the actions first, what we want that character to be doing, and then we worked his personality and profile to uh, justify the actions we needed. The twins are definitely, they were patients in the asylum. And Father Martin's a charismatic guy, right? If you're looking to manipulate people with spirituality, uh, aiming at people with mental illness is probably not an unprofitable way to go. The, the twins became under the thrall of Father Martin when they were all patients, right? Like it's it's sort of like they they, they met once they were inside of there and he, he kind of, you know, pulled them into his uh, radius. But yeah, I think he's a talking guy. I don't, I don't think he's writing that much down outside of what he writes on the walls. Cults are all over the Val last games. And I, and I feel like that's a lot of, I mean, like we've, we're, we're doing this because we're 10 years in, right? We've been doing these for 10 years. The thing that I've seen over and over in the last 10 years is that everything is becoming a cult, right? That like you used to be able to have a conversation with somebody who, somebody who, who was like, a fan of be like, yeah, I liked all of this, except I didn't like that. And now you say that and you're talking to somebody who's in a cult who like bites your head off. And the same thing about politics, same thing about religion. It's like everything in the world is a cult now. And I feel like that's what we've always been talking about with, with the outlast. It's just that like everything eventually becomes a cult. Frank Madera wasn't crazy. First of all, crazy is not a great term to use. Um, but I don't think he'd be a musician or a cook. I don't imagine him as especially musical. I could see him more of a, uh, uh, God, God, if he was in New York in the early 80s, he would have been a performance artist. You know, like he would have loved uh, that kind of physicality. I think cooking for him is probably something more that he would want to do uh, as an amateur, because it's more about the the passion than the the profession of it. I mean, and Rob Zombie, everybody who makes horror are, are all unbelievably sweet people. Like when I when I've seen Rob Zombie in Los Angeles a couple times, and it's always at a vegan restaurant, so I, I don't think he's a cannibal. I don't know. I, I kind of imagine Frank Minera would want to do something really, really just like uh, physical and focusing. I, I could see him being a yoga instructor. I'm gonna be cheesy and go with Trigger. I mean, it's a, it's the best character. Why am I speaking in English? <laughs> I fooled you all, guys. <laughs> I can't speak in English. I really like Trigger. It's mostly because, like, like me, uh, we're kind of uh, tall, we're skinny, uh, we're weird, and uh, we're both sarcastic. So it's it's kind of it's me without the sin. Trigger has got the best quotes. Everybody remer remembers his quotes. We, we speak as Trigger all the time in the studio. Um, he's got the best cut scene. We got the finger cuts. Like, uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, honestly, probably the, the characters I have the most fun writing are the Pauls from the comics. Inside the games, I mean, I've always, I've always felt very sympathetic towards Chris Walker. And I, I kind of like how little opportunity he has to express himself, but how much he he wants to do the right thing. You know, the characters who just have a lot of fun shit to say, you know, like uh, uh, Val in, in the second one or Eric Lusco. Like, like anytime you're typing, I watched my father fuck your god to death or whatever, like it's a fun day at work. Moi, je dirais que c'est le groom. J'aime le contraste de ce personnage-là. Il y a plusieurs facettes à sa, à sa personnalité, s'il y a peut-être même plusieurs personnalités, parce qu'il il, il veut, il veut créer quelque chose, mais il, il, il est dégueulasse en même temps, puis il est propre d'un autre côté, il veut, il veut bien paraître, mais c'est pas beau ce qu'il fait. C'est un personnage qu'on qui, qu voit pas très longtemps, mais qui m'a quand même marqué, je dirais. Ouais. I guess I would have to say Eddie as a character. Yeah, Eddie, but a close second is actually Blake in Outlast 2. Uh, his whole arc, uh, 
uh, was uh, something very uh, fascinating to uh, to create. Uh, in terms of enemy, it would be Eddie. Uh, but but overall, I think the uh, uh, the, the the arc we created for Blake and Atlas to uh, was interesting as well, and was uh, it was uh, sometimes uncomfortable to to do, but uh, also creatively uh, a fun challenge. It has to be Chris Walker. Do you want me to say why? It was the first character when I came on on Outlast One. It was one of the first characters I did a fatality for, and my mission was, you know, growing up as a kid. The most violent game we had around was Mortal Kombat, and Sub Zero's head rip fatality was like the most gruesome thing in the world and when you have a character like Chris Walker and you have an instruction from your bosses of please decapitate the player it's just like thank you I get to do my dream of outdoing what you know I think is outdoing sort of my little gruesome brutal benchmark and being able to rip the player's body off of his head as Chris Walker was like this is my favorite character. He's big, he's hulking, he's the ultimate enemy, and he rips your body off from you. So that's why he's my favorite character. He allowed me to do all the do all these violent things and become an outlet for just kind of fun and scary stuff.